is the human spirit eternal. The final word must come from God your Father. I've used this text many times. That's what I'm going to be giving here, man. I used this text many times in this series of videos as well as in others. Here, it again would underline and highlight the stretched depths. And such confidence, confidence, are we having through Christ? Now you're going to get this from the corner of mine. The mind of Christ in our human spirit, in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Apart from that, you're not going to get this. You're going to disagree with it, argue with it. So such confidence are we having through Christ, the mind of Christ in our human spirit, in partnership with the Holy Spirit, toward God, our Father. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves, the fallen corner of mind, to evaluate anything, the subject matter of our human spirit being eternal. This evaluation originating from ourselves is not our own self-willed opinions, be it secular or religious, but our sufficiency has its source in God, who also made us, made us, sufficient by the gift of the same mind that was in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, now being in us. That's what I'm saying. That's your source of information. Not the opinions of others, not your own opinions, but waiting to your spirit for the Father to reveal this. By the gift of the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, now being in us, as those who minister a testament, new in quality, something new to us in our carnal mind, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse five. This verse alone knocks out this idea of using the unaided mind, the carnal mind, as I mentioned, someone advocated in a comment of one of my videos. Our minds aren't sufficient enough to do this. If that ain't proof enough, then I don't know what is going on. So, in light of this text and others which I have and will once again bring out to reveal how their final word must come from the Father of our human spirits on this matter of whether our human spirit is eternal or it was created. Something that I have been stressing in all the divisions of this series. We read in the above text these words, Our sufficiency has its source in God. Now catch this part. Who also made us sufficient. So the question is, when did he make us sufficient? As I brought out in the other video in this series, there are those who would say that he made us sufficient on the day that we, I quote, got saved. Now think with me. Beyond what you may have heard from 10,000 other instructors in Christ, these heaped up teachers, something the Apostle Paul stressed in the following verse of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers, for in Christ, with the mind of Christ, for in Christ, I have begotten you through the gospel. He wasn't saying that he was their father. He was expressing through his human spirit what the father had told him to say. It was a vessel saying this. Paul here is narrowing it down as I'm instructed to do to one father. We know, as I'm sure Paul was aware of, that we were warned by the father through Jesus to call no man your father, 
you have won. Now, religious folk would argue that in context, Jesus was referring only to the Jewish individuals and not the secular world around them, going so far as to calling them Gentile dogs unable to hear from God. Here's that text where Jesus warns us to not call any man father. Matthew 23, 9. The same with the book of Matthew was written to the Jews, not to the Gentile. Well, we'll find out. Matthew 23, verse 9. And call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven. See that stressing of earth and heaven, which you came out in the last video? Now notice in context who Jesus was addressing. Take it in context. Chapter 23 of Matthew, first verse. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. In context, Jesus was addressing more than the Jewish people. There was a mixed multitude before him. In this whole chapter, Jesus is attacking the religious minds of his day. Go read that. All the woes. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. He does it in that chapter 23 who did not know that God was the eternal father of us all, was still a mystery, claimed that only they had some special claim on God. It's still being a, hid, a mystery hidden, later to be revealed by the Apostle Paul, who reminds them of this in Romans chapter 9. Now I'll have to do a lot of reading. Matter of fact, I might have to read this whole chapter of Romans chapter 9. Usually you let people go off and read it for themselves. I'm going to read it and give highlights of what Paul was saying. I read this and I have read this in context of the chapter, so don't get distracted and lose the focus on how this related to our eternal sonship and how these Jews should have known this. Remember Nick News? Your teacher is you know, know these things. They should have known this. Paul didn't know it. It took him 14 years to come to see it. The same thing today, this matter of our eternal ship, sonship, should be known and not argued about. We have various denominations claiming only they are the sons of God according to their religious ideas and behavior. Let me read on here. Hermes chapter 9 from the King James text. So they can't complain about that. Verse 1. I say the truth. How? In Christ. Wasn't Paul apostles' opinion or the opinions of others? He's getting this in Christ, in his spirit, coming directly from God his Father and our Father. I lie not. My conscience also bury me witness in the Holy Ghost. Not that old evil conscience. A renewed conscience. Kind of a father. God is your father. To have great heaviness and continued sorrow in my heart. I do, and those that have understand what I've been saying in this series and the other series of videos, have sorrow in their heart. There were so few. There should be many. We all should know this thing. Paul says it in other texts. He was excited about what he had discovered in that 14 years period. What did he discover? No one will ever have to say to him, no, the Lord, because all will know from the least to the greatest. Well, it's sad to say, and in deep sorrow, that day didn't come for all, but came to a few down to human church history, you see it. I've traced that. And like I said, for a long time, I didn't know it. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, 
according to the flesh, and your kinsmen, your family, your friends, your work associates, those are people you associate with in religious settings. You wish they would see this too. Who are Israelites? He's talking, talking to his particular race, his culture, his secular religious creeds, and his opinion as a male individual. Who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption? Now hear that. Who to whom pertain the adoption? The adoption. The son placement. And that son placement being the eternal matter. And that one day we will be glorified. And the covenant, Old Testament, New Testament, when you read the whole Bible, not just the Old Testament, not just the New Testament, it's both that you discover this. And the giving of the law, its purpose was to bring us back to the promise. Paul said that, which came first, the law or the promise? The promise. And service of God and the promises. Powerful. I mean, <laughs> it gave more and more proof. As what God has been sharing to me and a few others, which is available to all, it's not Gnostic teaching, it's for all. Who are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. There's how he says that. Concerning the flesh, Christ came. The fathers. You see this when later on he said, Do I know Christ after the flesh? I don't know him that way anymore. How do you know him after the spirit? But here he's addressing as unto the flesh. In the corner view of perspective. Who's over all? God bless forever. Amen. Not as through the word of God had taken none effect. You see here him expressing the idea of the letter. Getting past the letter. Getting to the spirit of that letter. Bringing that letter alive. For some it had no effect. And never got into the spirit of the word. All he had was the letter of it. He's not learning this. We're not learning this. There are those who see this. For they are not all Israel, which are Israel. They're all not Christians. They claim to be Christians. They're not all saved. who claim to be saved. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham. Just because they could trace their roots back to their genealogy to being of the 12 tribes of Israel. Nor can we, tracing our roots back to our forefathers of our so-called faiths, our denomination. My great-great-grandfather was a Baptist. My grandfather was a Baptist. My dad was a Baptist. Now I'm a Baptist. The idea of faith, I bring out many video on that. It's talking about the faith of Christ. Faith is the substance of things hopeful, the evidence of things not seen. It has nothing to do with the seen. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham or they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. The seed. Remember the seed. A seed is in us all. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. Hear that? They which are the children of the flesh, race, cause, and second religious creeds, opinions of gender, male, female, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise. 
accounted for the seed. The promise that came up before the foundations of this world. I mean, I've labored my other videos to bring this out. That's why I'm not doing it here. For this is the word of promise expressed in the material world. At that time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. Not only this, but when Rebecca also conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the children be yet not born. The eternal matter. Neither having gone done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him that called. Your sonship and your father had nothing to do with anything of this flesh. Has a lot to do with God being your eternal father and you being begotten in Christ before the foundations of this world. And you coming into the loins of Adam, born and not knowing this. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, right? As is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Why did he hate Esau? He sold his birthright. And you know how many people are selling their birthright today? For some individual called father? You have the God-given birthright to claim that you're a son of God. To what Christ accomplished. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, not by the will of men. John chapter 1 says that. He had the God-given right to claim to your son of God, but it's not by the will of any man, any teachings of man, but your father. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, it's not your performance, but of God that showeth mercy. The difference between grace and mercy, grace is giving you something you do not deserve. And mercy is holding back what you do deserve. To him to say to me, you someday I never knew you, because you denied him as your father. For scripture said unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will have, he will, he harden. Controversial text, this whole chapter here. But divine election, predestination, and the arguments that go on that. I'm not going to get into that here. That was saying to me, why does he yet find Paul, for whom he had resisted his will? It's a good question. Why did he find Paul? Let me read on. We're going to come back to this. Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that thou repliest against God? <laughs> You're not sufficient yourself to reason anything. You're going to argue with God about how he performs things. So the thing for him say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me this thus, you know? Well, we're going to find out who made what. Had not the potter power of the clay, of the same lump, to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his mercy, or his, his wait a minute, what if God's willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, Endure with such long suffering the vessels of wrath needing fitting to destruction. 
and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had before here that which he had before afore prepared unto glory even us whom he had called not the Jews only but also the Gentiles as he said also in Asi I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which were not my beloved and so come to pass that in the praise for it was said to them ye are not my people they shall there shall they be called the children of the living God the children I'm calling people the children of God calling them God their father and they're saying how dare you say that well, let me read on Oh, here you use that word Isha. It's Isaiah, also quite concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Now I'm going to accept this. God is their father. They have an idea of father. They say we have fa- Abraham is our father. No, he, 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 <laughs> yeah, I say they use that quite a bit. Abraham's your father. God's your father. He expressed that through Abraham. Viva promise. This is what you might call half truth. He was the father of their flesh, according to the flesh. But according to his spirit, God is their father. A mystery to him in the Old Testament. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the short work work will the Lord make upon the earth. Now I got a whole video on that. I'm not going to get in that. Powerful video. He cuts the work short. He's going to deal with the Jew, Gentile, and Church of God. Three distinct groups. The video, I'll post it up here so you can go find it. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been like Sodom and we had been like Gomorrah. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, had not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they saw it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. And as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him shall not be ashamed. I may come back someday and go to greater depth of just this chapter, chapter 9 of Romans. I mean, there's so much more there. But I want to move on. That gives you some highlights of what I mean by reading that, just that chapter. You can see this eternal sonship being offered and being rejected by some. And without getting into the controversy, you see with all this predestination and election, Calvin and his ideas are not having a free will that God makes people the way he wants to make them. We're not talking about that. Just to know that what I'm sharing here isn't universalism in their teaching or Calvin. Because one must make a decision to accept this eternal fact or reject it going with your self-willed religious ideas. Rejecting this and choosing to call anyone else father after the flesh, secular or religious, places you in a position that one day God who was and could have been your father has him professing that which you have Believe, saying to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who worked the iniquity. That iniquity of their fallen parents reaching to the third and fourth generation based in this fallen fleshly ideas of race, culture, creeds, and gender, as I've been told to say over and over and over, that which could have been 
a good means of expression, the flesh, after the fall of humanity becomes no good. Paul saying, even me that in my faith there dwells no good thing. And that it is self willed and not God's will. His eternal will. His will none would perish, they always become sons of God. It didn't work out that way. And in this case, God being our true and only Father. Well, even today, many of religious individuals still think this way. We hear this again in what Paul shared, once shared in Hebrews, chapter 12, stressing how so-called, we have so-called fathers of our flesh, and that's for us to focus on the father of our spirit. It's a warning, which will reveal true life. I mean, eternal life. Eternal father. Link this with what Paul just shared in uh, these above words. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel, the good news. What was Paul's good news? Might it be the eternal fact that God is the father of your spirit and that this, the so-called fathers of this world, be it your natural dad or some priest with a title of father, or some individual thinking that he or she fathered your, you spiritually, got you saved to their particular denomination, racking up points, boasting of how many souls their denomination have won. Paul encountered this with the Church of Galatia. You read it in context. You know that Paul was addressing Gentiles, saying to them, that God is their father as well as the Jewish religious minds of his day. They called him a heretic for saying that God was the father of those, these so-called Gentile dogs. you get the same today. Laboring you with some label, as I imagine, of being a universalist or what's called inclusion and, and a lot of other labels. So Paul, here's chapter 4, Galatians. Now I say that the heir inheritance as long as he is a child different not from a servant though he be lord of all notice first that we are heirs unaware Jew and Gentile and unaware immature children of God that has our carnal minds ideas of who we are and who our true father is, blocked. Thus for the longest time, we first believe you didn't know all this, until the Holy Spirit awakens your spirit to this fact. You don't appear to be any different than an individual who has no idea or belief that God is our true father. Little do we uh, realize just who we are, sons of God. God, imagine that. Many of Reginville fits this picture. They don't disbelieve in God. You haven't a clue that God truly is their father and always was. Having you hidden, being born into a natural world. Now imagine this. God is your real father. I mean, really, really, your real father. Imagine with him being your father, who or what could become against you? I don't mess with my father. I would pity the individual that would come against anyone who really knows this and the power of who his father is. They may wish that they were never born. <laughs> Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. He's alive to you. He's not some fathom or religious cliché. He's really your father. You read in the Amplified. It is a fearful and terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God in curing his judgment and wrath. Read on in context of Galatians chapter 4. For the longest time we were under tutors and governors and the time pointing of the father, your father. You don't realize who your father is. 
Now know this, once again, we are under tutors and governors who should know, now these tutors and governors should know who their true father is and not claiming this for themselves, waiting for a time pointed by their father to reveal to those that they are ministering to this eternal fact of who truly is their father and always was. Not them. They're not Lord and the flock. As the father's timing, this mask of the flesh is removed slowly. The progress there. I didn't get this overnight. Neither did Paul. Fourteen years are slowly removing the mask of the flesh. He's put grace, cause, and sacrilegious creeds. Viewing how this mess was iniquity. Evil's creation to hide their father from them by those unaware or who have out and out rejected any idea of God our Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Yes, we were under the bondage of our fleshly carnal view of who we are. The elements of the world, the flesh, the devil. Now you see what the Apostle Paul saw. The shock of this awakening moment saying, in me, that is in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. And who will save me from this embodiment of death? What a shock. He, he came to know that God was his father. And through the mind of Christ in him, his father, our father, of Jew and Gentile, spoke to him, having him, his spirit crying, Abba, Father. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now you get part of the gospel that Paul stresses in 1 Corinthians 15. Everybody used this gospel. 15, 1 through 4. How the Son of God came in the fullness of time, came to a bios body like ours, to the womb of Mary, made under the law, being more than the Ten Commandments or something, made under our natural infirmities, made like us, touched with our condition as Scripture reveals. Hebrews 4 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He never acted any benefit from the Father. That gets us back to the Father. One for one. To redeem that were, them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Son placement. The deeper meaning to the word adoption from Ephesians 1.5. Having predestined us and to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. It's to him and through him, according to the good pleasures of his will, not the will of the flesh, the world. Hear this from the Greek. This comes uh, from a Greek book. I don't usually do this, but it gives some confirmation for the skeptic. Ephesians 1 5, they are said to have been foreordained unto adoption a son to Jesus Christ. This is a Greek scholar speaking. Adoption of children is a mistranslation and misleading. God does not adopt believers as children. They're begotten, eternally begotten. As such by his Holy Spirit through faith. The substance of things over the evidence of things not seen. Adoption is a term involving the dignity of the relationship of believers as sons. As sons. It is not a putting into the family by spiritual birth. But a putting into the position of son. You were son place eternally begotten in Christ this has been revealed to my spirit and I shared in this series we were begotten in Christ before the foundations of this fallen creation which this fallen creation has hid this from us all 
this mystery. It's called the mystery of godliness. So if you're here that say, what's the mystery of godliness? You just heard it. You're a son of God. You were created that way. Eternally created. Say the word create. You think there's no beginning. No, <laughs> there is no beginning. You think of beginning and end. You were eternally to be forever. And you will be forever. Either in this or eternally separated from it's up to you. You read it in the very next verse of Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons, hear that again, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, just like him. His spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a son of God. It's his Holy Spirit that leads me to this and gets me to cry back to my Father. You see the partnership the Holy Spirit bringing us to this eternal fact of our sonship once hidden. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, an heir of God through Christ. Because of the eternal fact, you are an heir of God through your being eternally begotten in Christ as we have seen in this series of videos, this is the truth. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. When you were not aware of this eternal fact, he's forgiven you for that. We all came that way. We didn't know. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known of God, become the discover you know him. He's your father. You're his son. Here it is. Had Paul had taught them that. He shared them what he picked up in fourteen years. Now turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. You observe days, months, and times and years. All elements of the fallen created time. They were going back to things seen and leaving those things unseen that were eternal. Exchanging things eternal for things temporal. Getting distracted by the so-called reality of this ball world. And Paul says, I'm afraid of you. That's why I bestowed upon you to labor in vain. Brethren, I beg you, I beseech you, be as I am, for as I am as you are, Ye have not injured me, not at all. Be as I am, for I am as you are. Paul was going through the same cleansing and weaning he had and still was going through. And have not injured me at all. Something I shared in a commentary in one of my videos. The dam breaks slowly over time. And our surrendering moment by moment until all of us flows rivers of living water. For the longest time, the Holy Spirit is flushing out what the Apostle Paul called dung. In those moments of flushing, we ourselves and that of others, we learn not to judge one another in those moments. We ain't arrived yet, brother, none of us. This should be known by us all, as is written in Hebrews chapter 12. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scoureth every son whom he receive. If ye endure chastening, God deal with you as with a son. For what son is he whom the Father Chastens is not. God's your father. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof of all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. As sons of God, you come to expect that not only for yourself, but also for all, aware or unaware, you judging God's correction of another 
thinking you have arrived, will come to bite you. <laughs> you are a son of God. He will correct you at that moment for thinking you have arrived. So let me finish what I shared in that comment. It would be like someone judging you for ridding your body of substance that are of no nutritional value, going to the bathroom, you know. In our case, to turn it down, the apostle called it wood, hay, and stubble, things of no eternal value that we have picked up through our lives in this fallen state. And to think that our crap doesn't stink, you end up constipated, full of BS or dung, for the skeptic, don't get mad at me for all this is written. You just don't want to see it or believe it. This generation is full of it, that they're getting ready to explode. Just watch the current debates and the game, blame game that's going on. They used to fling what's called mud, but today it does it goes by another name. It's not mud. That the self righteous years cannot hear. The Holy Spirit is sending fire to set their ears on fire and hope that some just might see and hear the truth expressed by the Paul, the Apostle, in me that is my flesh that dwells no good thing. Who will deliver me from this embodiment of death? Only through a cleansed heart will they ever understand that the treasures that they seek is hidden in these earthen vessels that the excellency would be of God and not of any of us. From out of our awakened human spirit, by the Holy Spirit, we could discover the gold, silver, and precious stones in our treasure chest. Our inheritance given to us by the grace and mercy of God and not anything coming from this cesspool that we think we have earned. So let me end on that note. Just know, that God's your Father. He loves you. Even those moments He has to discipline you. He loves you. And if He didn't, He would prove that He doesn't love you. Thank God for tribulations. And you're being patient in those moments, knowing that's for your certain good. And gain a hold of the hope of that moment. Hope of your calling. And God give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes be open and realize the hope of your calling to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.